no cuts. I'm very excited about today's chat about Tensegrity. For those of you from the cervical instability communities, welcome, welcome back. And for those of you that are from my Instagram that are probably looking at this for more of a performance angle, also welcome. The contrast between people with chronic issues and elite sports performance is actually very important when we talk about these types of topics because understanding both points of view, point of views gets you to understand the topic at a much deeper level. And we have to remember that Coach Chong founded Hyperarch Fascia Training by observing the elite naturals, seeing their common denominator, which was not their muscle size or their muscle strength, it was their internal foundation, how they were built through their fascial connection, something that had been completely overlooked, but that's what allowed him to then access this world of helping heal people through reverse engineering this process. So that's why it's very important to understand both sides. And Tensegrity covers both of these perfectly, especially if you have any condition that involves the word instability. If you get an ankle injury, you have an unstable ankle. If you have cervical instability, you have an unstable cervical spine. And for those people that want to understand a bit more about Tensegrity for their elite performance, this will be perfect for you. So let's start off with a bit of a recap. Fascia is one continuous piece throughout the body. There is no beginning and no end. That's why we consider it the endless web. So that alone, I want you to have stuck in your brain as to why Tensegrity then becomes so important. The second thing is, when you have a condition like cervical instability, it is not just the ligaments and tendons. Perhaps that's what you've heard of before. There's lots of talk, especially about ligaments, but that's not the whole story because as we just discussed, fascia is all the connective tissues except for cartilage and may even include bone. There's an ongoing discussion that bone might be included in the whole fascia conversation. However, that's ongoing, so I'm not going to talk too much on that. But fascia does permeate through and strengthen bone. And bone's a very important part of the tensegrity system. We will talk a bit more about this. Fascia tensegrity is made up of two elements, tension and integrity. We have the tension elements, which are like the strings, and the integral elements, which are like the struts, the supports. This is where we get struts and strings from. So the bone, obviously, makes up these supports, which the strings, the tension elements, can attach to. However, as I just described, the fascia actually permeates through and enhances the strength of bone. So both of these things actually have to work together Together in synergy to create the overall structure of the human body, which is held together ultimately through tensegrity. A break in tensegrity means a break in the structure as a whole. As I said, fascia is one piece. I'm repeating this because I want you guys to listen. Fascia is one continuous piece, not just ligaments and tendons. It's everything working together in tensegrity. And if you lose tension in one area, it can affect all other areas of the body potentially. And this comes in the form of compensation patterns. You'll hear me talk about this in the coming minutes. I just really wanted to emphasize on this point and get you to understand this so then you can apply this knowledge to the mainstream protocols that you've perhaps tried or looking at potentially trying yourself. So cervical instability, any type of instability, it's not just about one specific ligament or tendon because when we talk about tensegrity, we're talking about the whole body coming together, holding tension and having integral parts to then create tensegrity, to then create whole body strength. All right, the tensegrity no network and the fascia connections, the internal foundation dictates our form, how our body is actually formed. Fascia including tendons and ligaments, of course, is holding our skeletal structure together. It's also holding our muscles together, wrapping down to the individual muscle cell. So without fascia, we just fall apart. Even with muscles without fascia, they're just mush. They don't have the structure. So we have to remember fascia is making up our form and our structure internally with tension and with these connections being tensioned properly. You can probably start to see where I'm going with this. In an elite sports perspective, tensegrity and form suspends weight and pressure away from the joints. So one of the things that Coach Chong noticed was that these elite naturals, their heels are often elevated when they play, when they're running, chopping, changing direction, when there's lots of force being put through the body. Their heels are often elevated. How is this? 
because of the suspension of the weight from the joints through the fascia through, through the fascia tensegrity network it's actually distributing the force throughout the entire body it's not being concentrated at one point and when forces are concentrated at one point this is often when we get compensation patterns and pain this is where things wear out or gain irritation this might be where an issue seems to be isolated but in reality the whole body has to be addressed but it just so happens that the compensation pattern, the forces have just been concentrated there. So distribution of forces is really important. And we see this both in athletic performance, in elite naturals, people that are performing at the highest level, of course, when they're running, it's not just going to their calves, well, hopefully not just going to their calves, being distributed throughout the fascia network. And also, fascia has a massive, massive amount of capacity to store and also use elastic recoil of energy. So if you think of somebody that maybe is not very well connected as they're running, their body's probably jarring, their joints are probably not feeling good, but somebody who has a good level of tensegrity that elastic energy is flowing through them and they're actually able to use that to recoil, just like the kangaroo. The kangaroo can hop along at a certain speed. They did a study, I think it's about 10 kilometers an hour, and they looked at then upping the speed by about two or three more kilometers per hour, and their VO2 max did not change. Their oxygen consumption did not change, so they're using the elastic recoil energy. But how does that actually, what does this actually matter when I'm talking to you guys about cervical instability? Well, of course, as I said, tensegrity is forming our structure as a whole. So tensegrity is not just about in motion, but about being here, just still as we are, just here, sitting here. This is forming our structure. And obviously, when people have very serious conditions like cervical instability, depending on what level you're at, depending on what the level of damage is, some people find it hard to hold their head up even. And that is not just because there is weakness in the muscles, but also weakness in the fascia. Lack of fascial connections, lack of strength of fascial connections, and of course, the tensegrity network has been damaged. So when we lose tension, this is when we get instability. As we know from Jan Wilk's work, 86% of all sports injuries happen on the fascia and not the muscle. So what does this tell us? This tells us that the fascia has become the weakest link because perhaps it's because it's been ignored. Because we understand that 22 kilos of fascia, or 18 to 22 kilos of fascia, are discarded, removed from the cadavers during human anatomy dissection just to study the muscle. So we've got a problem. We've removed a ton of material. We can't seem to fix this problem Hmm, maybe it's because of this. And then all of a sudden we have this epidemic of fascial-based injuries. If you flip the coin, you're probably a good chance it's going to land on the side. Oh, let me rephrase this. I'm not going to make any cuts. If you flipped a coin and it had an 86% chance of landing on one side and only a 14% chance of landing on the other side, you're probably not going to flip the coin thinking it's going to land on the muscle side. I hope that makes sense. Maybe that's a poor analogy. But we do know cuts. We're going to keep moving on. So perhaps the fascia has been neglected and instead the muscle has had too much focus. But if you've had no success in mainstream protocols, maybe it's time to try something else. Okay. So muscle focus training does not address fascial connections. So if 86% of injuries happen on the fascia, and not the muscle, and we do muscle focus training, and we don't get the results that we desire, it's because it's not attending to the tensegrity structure. It's not creating new connections. It's not rehabilitating those damaged connections. How do we remodel the damaged fascia connections and create the stability that we're after and repair the damaged areas that our body may not have been able to naturally recover from? Well, we do this through utilizing fascia's properties and behaviors with hyperarch fascia training, just to give the body the stimulus that it needs to be able to resolve itself. This is like a recipe, a formula, a sequence in order to create more myofibroblast cells that have twice the capacity to remodel the fascia and repair damage and remove inflammation than the normal fascia fibroblast cells do. This is the unique work of Chong. I just thought I would remind you if you have not heard me talk about this in the previous videos. If you want to listen more about this, watch some of the other content because I go more in depth about this and how it works. Which is super important for the structure. So 
if we try mainstream approaches and they don't work, and perhaps we can even get compensation patterns start to form where force and pressure, as we talked about at the start, starts to be channeled through different areas to offload the body part that has been injured or feels weak. Naturally, we're going to try and take pressure away from this area, and then perhaps we might have a higher risk of getting injured in another area. And this is why people that have ankle injuries have about a four times higher likelihood of getting a hamstring injury afterwards. Tensegrity's been lost, how the forces are distributed, change. Water break. I need two hands. Now, of course, there are people that get good results from doing mainstream protocols and training, but this is because of individual differences. So this is the best thing about Coach Chong's work. You have so many people arguing, oh, but this thing did this for this person, this thing did that for this person. We're not saying that it's not possible to fix your injury or your illness or whatever in many different ways. But what we're saying is that fascia, internal foundation and individual differences determine if somebody is actually able to fix their problem with this or this or this, and it actually explains how we can have such a variety of outcomes from doing the same stimulus. So this is the thing that I love the most. When people wanna argue about fascia and this and that, and this person got this result from lifting weights and this person didn't, you can say, okay, but every single person's internal foundation and fascial connections are different based on their environment, the environment that they've been in, that they've grown up in. Have they worn shoes? Have they worn orthotics? The, the environment they've been in now, do they spend a lot of time inside sitting down? Do they eat a lot of sugar? This type of thing, it all, all is important when we take into consideration how somebody, if somebody's able to resolve the injury through this protocol or this protocol. So fascia internal foundation and individual differences is very important to consider. But Chong's work explains why this is the case and explains that if we create better connections, then we can get better results through our different protocols that we do. This is another reason why elite athletes have surgery and return so much faster than just somebody else that has surgery. Perhaps it might take them a long time to get back to where they're feeling in a good condition, but the elite athlete can actually return pretty quickly to playing sport again. So... We need to look at creating connections and adding structure, adding tension back into the system so it works as one unit, as one spring. And I'll put up photos of tensegrity structures so you can see what they look like, so you can have a bit of a look because it's important that you understand the body is not just ligaments, muscles, bones. It's everything together. Everything is working together and the fascia system is what is connecting everything physically but also literally with information, with communication. And this is the last thing I want to talk, and especially for those people that have fatigue problems, because this is another thing that you might not have considered. Fascia is also a communication network of neurological information, but also energy. I've made a video on piezoelectricity and why this is important, but this is crucial for healing because, and I'm going to use myself as an example here, something that I have not shared yet. If you have an issue with your fascia connections, you may be experiencing high levels of fatigue because the fascia tensegrity network takes the energy from the mitochondria, the biophotons, and it distributes it throughout the entire body. So if you have a problem with the fascia system, if you have a problem with distribution, you may have a problem with fatigue. On the flip side, somebody may have a problem with making energy in their mitochondria, but their distribution is fine, and they also have a problem with fatigue. In my case, I had a TBI, I had a concussion. So my mitochondria had a hard time creating enough energy to re not only run my body, but regenerate damaged tissues. But I also had damage in my fascia network. So my ability to distribute energy throughout my body was entirely impacted. And this is where I got my neurological symptoms, my visual symptoms, and I also got a lot of physical symptoms from as well. I had a very hard time recovering. So for me, I understood that recovering the physical structures was a crucial part of being able to then rehabilitate other tissues because you can have a problem distributing the energy. You can also have a problem creating the energy, creating the energy, or you can have a problem with both. So that's something that's really important to consider. And this is why I really hardly vouch 
hardly, I really strongly vouch for people to understand their condition and what they need to do, the steps that they need to take because the work that I did with Chong was a huge part of my story, but it was a very important part to make sure that I had the physical connections strengthened and there properly to distribute that energy, the piezoelectricity, so that my tissues could regenerate, could heal, for then other processes to take place to then also heal my eyes. In a sport context, if you're somebody that has damage to the fascia tensegrity network, you're going to leak energy. You're going to find that the muscles are starting to work over time. You're going to get that muscle burning feeling where the muscle contractions are having to occur more frequently. You're using more ATP in theory than somebody who is more fascially driven, whose tensegrity network is working properly. The exact same example I gave with the kangaroo, hopping, hopping, hopping. They're not using more oxygen, more energy. They're utilizing the free energy. So if you're somebody that has had an injury that is ongoing, when you're playing, you may be leaking energy. In an injury context, and this will be my last point for you cervical instability folk out there, I'm sure a lot of you will probably resonate with this. This is another personal story. So we can get compensation patterns form. Often the cervical instability is occurring at the back of the neck, not so much at the front of the neck. But what people find, or what I found, is that my sternocleidoid mastoid, I'm pretty sure I've pronounced that right today, the big muscle that runs down through here was heavily overloaded and was just chronically tight. So when I talk about having experience with dry needling and massage therapies and other fascia therapies, I had a lot of work done on my neck because it was always chronically tight and it would give some temporary relief. It would never fix the whole issue. Some temporary relief over a short period of time, maybe one or two days, and then that relief would go because we have not fixed the structural issue. This muscle is being overloaded because the tension in the whole system has been lost. And as that occurs over time, you can lose more tension throughout the whole system. If the body is not recovering itself, it may need a little bit of help with protocols like hyperarch fascia training. And we've talked about all the characteristics that go along with hyperarch fascia training and why it does things differently to mainstream training. So I had some of my visual symptoms coming from the sternocleidomastoid. When I'd have it massaged or dry needled or cupped or whatever, then I would get a relief in the pressure and the pain and even some of the visual symptoms behind my eyes, but it would never fix the issue because I actually had to fix the structure of my whole neck in order for this to stop being overloaded. This is the difference between treating a symptom or treating the structure and the actual root cause of the problem. Hopefully you enjoyed today's lesson. I've shared some stories there that I've not shared before, so I'm sure you guys will have enjoyed listening to them. If you have any questions, please send me a message. I enjoy making these videos. I enjoy teaching what I've learnt and hopefully adding some more pieces of the puzzle to you guys. Fascia and tensegrity is a really cool topic. I love talking about it, and perhaps I'll talk a bit more about it in a sports context, but hopefully for now you understand it in an injury context, understanding that fascia is the continuous network throughout the whole body, one piece, no beginning or end. So if the tension is impacted here, it may have other effects throughout the body, and this is where we might start to get some weird symptoms. Thanks for listening.